how cold is it? And how do you actually get there? Today, we're talking about Antarctica. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. So last month we had a record number of downloads and we just want to thank you guys for being loyal listeners and just remind you that if you haven't subscribed, make sure you go into your podcast app and just hit the subscribe button so that you will not miss out on any future episodes. And thank you as always for listening. So Kim, how was your weekend? It was great. I had a Seattle staycation weekend with the girls. So we got to go play tourist in Seattle and it was a lot of fun. So did you stay downtown? We did. We stayed in Pioneer Square, which is an area of downtown that I've never been to. So it's right by where like CenturyLink Field is, which is where the Sounders and the Seahawks play. And our hotel, we actually stayed at this gorgeous Embassy Suites, Seattle Pioneer Square. And okay, when they told me I was going to stay at an Embassy Suites, I thought, okay, fine. You know, I'm picturing the four sided pyramid, you know, central Mm -hmm. atrium lobby but this is totally different it is the most amazing embassy suites i've ever been at so it's exactly what you would expect from you know a downtown kind of high-end hotel we were on the top floor which was the 23rd floor they actually upgraded us into a two-bedroom suite so we had and so they had a gorgeous you know downtown hotel lobby it was not an embassy suites feel at all on the second floor is where they had breakfast in the mornings and then the manager's reception And then on the eighth floor, they have a rooftop pool that's actually enclosed. So if it's, they kind of leave a door open so you can go out and have lounge chairs and Mm. kind of be on this rooftop, but you've got a, you know, heated indoor pool and it's just gorgeous. So not at all was what I was expecting. And of course, being in a penthouse suite with two teens and a tween and myself was really nice. It was a gorgeous property. So I was definitely excited to see because it was not, I mean, I'm sure you can picture in your head and if our listeners have stayed in embassy suites, it's not at all what I was expecting. So nice that kind of Visit Seattle had picked that location for us. And it was nice that we got surprised about that. And it's perfect cool. if, you know, yeah, if I we're sports in, people. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I thought I was in Pioneer Square when I was there a couple years ago. I think that's where the underground tours yes. maybe left from. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, so. yeah, the underground tour leaves from Pioneer Square. Pioneer Square is kind of so it's on the, you know, if you're thinking of downtown Seattle, like what everybody thinks of like downtown Pike Place Market, Pioneer Square is just south of that. And so it's definitely more of a, I consider it kind of more of the grungy feel of Seattle. It's got, you know, lots of bars. It's a pretty happening nightlife type place. So it's definitely got kind of a, a unique feel for the city. It's Definitely a kind of the restaurant, museums, lots of art museums, lots of clubs, things like that. And then, of course, it's also right next to the sports district. So it's a huge spot. There's King Street Station is a major transport station that's right there. And it's also right next to Chinatown, like International District. So it's kind of a a cool little area. It's just different than what most people think of when they think of downtown Seattle. So Yeah, I feel like when we were there, we also went into some like really old bar that I don't know, maybe it was like tied into, I can't remember, but like probably someone in the, like someone in the grunge, in the grunge. You know, yeah. Era, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, it was, yeah, definitely, definitely grittier. Yes. Um, yep. But you can tell there was a lot going on there. Yeah. So it's, it's, cool. a, so, it's gritty, but it's cool. It's, it's, I mean, it's, I think of it as very Seattle. So, yeah. So what kind of things did you guys get up to? So we were visiting with Visit, if you know, partnership with Visit Seattle, all about, you know, talking about Seattle Museum Month, which is happens every February. And it's a partnership that hotels and museums in the city do 
where if you stay at a hotel, even if you stay, you know, for a night overnight or like a staycation, you get a stay and play pass where you can use this pass then at, I think there's something like 20, I should have looked it up, but I want to say like 21 or 25 area museums and you get half price admission. And a lot of them are, you know, some of them are always free admissions, but I mean, places like Chihuly Glass and Museum of Pop Culture, Mopop, the Seattle Art Museum, and then the Seattle Aquarium. I mean, lots of really, really popular and expensive museums in the city, you get half price admission for up to four guests. So it's, you know, if a family is staying in a hotel room, you get four guests for the half price admission. And it can save a lot. I'm working on my post right now. And, you know, I'm sure you know, I mean, going to Mopop, I I want to say you can save something like 40 some odd dollars because, you know, it's an 80 six dollar pop for a family of four with two adults and two kids so it really is a great way to save money and have a great staycation and so for us we kind of the girls were really interested in the glass blowing and so we did this place in Tacoma called the Museum of Glass and I've never been there and it's a bit away so Tacoma it's about a 45 minute drive from you know kind of the Seattle heart of Seattle and of course you want to travel during off hours because of you know traffic. But we went down to the Museum of Glass. And it's a kind of a big part of, of course, Chihuly, but just the Pacific Northwest is a huge uh, center for glass blowing. And this they actually have a hot shop in this museum. So they have a couple of exhibits, but I think the real draw is this hot shop. And a hot shop is where they do, that's what it's called, where they do the actual glass blowing. And so we had, there was two artists that were in the hot shop for the day and you're able to go in and they have kind of like stadium seating along one wall. And then they have a ramp that you can stand and kind of look over and get a little closer to the action. Like you're actually right above the ovens. And we were just blown away. It was so cool to see the artistic work behind this. And I think going, we also went to Chihuly Garden and Glass on this weekend's vacation. And I think having gone to the Museum of Glass and seeing those guys work and seeing what it looks like in person and how hard it is. I think that was a really good for traveling with kids and kind of even as an adult to really see the intricacy and the artistic craftsmanship to glass blowing, and then to go to Chihuly and see kind of where he took it and get an idea of maybe what they had to do to manipulate the glass that way. It was a huge, you know, it was really awesome. I just think it's great. And Seattle's like I said, such a, you know, mecca for glass art and glass blowing. So I think it's a really cool thing to do when you're in Seattle. Neat. Yeah, we had gone to the Museum of Glass in Corning in New York. Yeah. And they also had like the hot shop and everything. And it, yeah, it, I know when we were going, Hannah was like, so is this going to be like, she was thinking like Corning Ware, you know, like <laughs> yeah. dishes and stuff. I'm like, no, it's so much more fun. So yeah, those can be really fun experiences. Yeah, I think it's cool. And it's neat to see different mediums of art. I think, you know, kids sometimes always think like art and they think drawing or painting, right? And so it's cool to kind of challenge those, you know, like what art is and just see yeah. different different expressions of it. It's really cool. And then we went to the Seattle Aquarium, which is somewhere we haven't gone that often, but you know, the girls really wanted to go and it's, you know, it's a good, it's just the Seattle Aquarium. They, I think the draw is the Pacific octopus that they have there. And of course they've got cute little, they have cute otters. Right? Otters. Yeah. They've got, and they supposedly have river otters and sea otters, right? I think, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so. I think they have both so that you're supposed to know the difference. And then they have a couple of sea lions and harbor seals, too. And it's it's just a nice, nice little aquarium to learn more about. A lot of it is about the Pacific Northwest waters and kind of what what we have here in the waters that are right there. And the waterfronts are undergoing a major renovation and redesign. And we actually went over and did the Great Wheel for the first time. We have never done that. And we did it at night. So it was kind of oh, fun neat. to see all the lights. But it, it freaked Lizzie out a little bit, you know, because it, it hangs over the water. At what, you know, mm-hmm. like so mm-hmm. you're going kind of backwards over the water. And it kind of spooked her a little bit. And then we did Wings Over Washington, which we did with you guys. And we were with Lizzie had brought her friend along because we decided to make it kind of a teen tween getaway and she brought her friend along and she had never been on the wings of the flyover washington or wings over washington 
yeah, wings over Washington and just loved it. It was so, so much fun. So, yeah, that's it. I wish that those rides lasted longer. <laughs> They're fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we got to try a few restaurants that we've never eaten at. And um, then we had to head home. We cut our cut our trip. We were supposed to go up the Space Needle on Sunday, but we cut our trip short because snow had started up north where we live. And uh, we realized that we needed to get home before the roads got too bad. So we actually came back a little early and we we're glad we did because we ended up getting nine inches of snow Sunday night. So <laughs> so it's funny good, good like, <laughs> just when just when it warmed up here you got snow and cold <laughs> I know it's so unheard of we get it you know like I said every five years or so we'll get a big dumping and then one year I remembered probably about five or six years ago school was canceled for a whole week because it just didn't melt and they don't have you know we don't get snow enough so they don't invest in the infrastructure of plows. you know lots of yeah. plows and snow trucks and sand trucks and stuff so we have no school again for two days so far, so we'll see how long this, this one lasts. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least they're being quiet for you. Yeah, they are. They're, you know, I'm sure they're on some screen killing brain cells, but <laughs> well, nowadays, it works. It's like you have, you know, they have Google Classroom. Like I know. To design work or something. Yeah. I know that's how it would be with Hannah because they have to bring their own computer. So no one can say that they can't have access, you know. So. Yeah. Well, our school, they actually get assigned Chromebooks. So mm -hmm. all the kids starting in fifth grade get assigned Chromebooks that they are responsible for and take home. So, yeah, I know. I know that Lizzie was already doing some um, studying and some work, you know, she did some homework for her math class already because they were supposed to have a quiz today. So well, my daughter's at a nuclear power plant today. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it's for her environmental science class and they do some field trips throughout the year. They haven't had one in a while, probably because of the, the weather. But last night she was like, yeah, they just said like wear closed toed shoes and yeah, I don't know, something else. She's like, yeah, there's apparently like there's some radiation, but it shouldn't be enough to be harmful. And I'm like, what? Shouldn't I have to sign a, a, like, a waiver for this or something? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you probably signed it. And you don't even realize, you know, it's one of those 18 pages they give you at the beginning of the year. <laughs> and can I just say like, this is, this is embarrassing, but she's talking about nuclear power plant. And I, all I could think about was like Homer Simpson. <laughs> Well, well out here we better. have one that's had some bad news out, you know, like Oregon or southern southern Washington. Like I, I know, know it's on I five. You can kind of see it. Those you know what you picture when it's a nuclear those funny yeah. shaped silos. And um, yeah, I don't know. So I'd be totally terrified. Yeah. I'll see but, if she's green when she comes home. Yeah, exactly. Well, we are going to wrap up. So I had a great time talking about Seattle. And now that we have snow, it's perfect segue into what we're going to be talking about today, which is going to be all about kind of a bucket list destination. Is it your bucket list on your bucket list, Tamara? It definitely is. Uh, and definitely for Hannah, like Glenn is pretty much like, yeah, no, I'm okay. But it's one of those things where I'm like, oh, it could be a, a mother daughter trip. But it's, you know, there's a lot of challenges, right? Like It's, <laughs> it's very expensive. And the crossing you know and the seasickness definitely has me really concerned but I know that Shelly has an answer to that so it'll be good to hear about her experience yeah I would I would say that I think it would be an awesome bucket list but I definitely have destinations that are over it and again like you said the crossing and getting getting to the destination would be my biggest worry so and then just how you have to tour around being on a boat all the time then we're even going to talk about how much it costs so they can stay and tune in and decide if that's what they're going to put on their bucket list all right let's get to it Today we're here with Shelly Bailey Shaw, and she is the founder and editor of Kid Tripster, which is an online family travel resource that provides information and inspiration to families that are traveling anywhere in the world. And as you may guess, Shelly does a fair amount of traveling herself. She's visited 46 states, 44 U.S. national parks, 34 countries, and as of last month, seven continents. She lives in Portland, Oregon, and is the mother of two boys, both 16 and 18. So welcome back, Shelly. It's so good to be here. I'm trying to think of when we had you on. It was probably a year or more ago. And did we talk about national parks? We, I think we were sharing maybe money-saving tips. 
Oh yeah. You know what apps I remember. Apps. We'll have to, oh, that's right. We yeah. can link to that one in the show notes. Yep. Thanks for coming back. I know you had a great experience that is on my bucket list that we want to get to in a minute, but can you give our listeners a little bit more of a background? I mean, thanks for your bio, but if you can share a little bit more about how you came to family travel, that would be helpful. Sure. So I live in Portland, Oregon. And as you mentioned, I'm the mother of two sons, uh, 16 and 18. My oldest is a freshman in college. So we've now entered a new stage of our life. I worked as a television journalist specializing in investigative reporting for more than 20 years. But my husband and I would always make time to travel with our kids. And in fact, in 2013, I took a sabbatical from work and embarked on a 72-day backpacking trip around the world with my boys. And that was really the start of my travel writing career, first as a freelancer. And then in 2016, I left TV News and founded Kid Tripster. So it's been a great way to marry my skills in journalism with my love of travel. Perfect mix. You know, I think all of us come to these things from very different backgrounds and you are one of the more professionals. You know, so many of us. You know, I mean I, I come from a marketing background. So I did a lot of I did a lot of writing and and you know, marketing work that goes along with having your own website, but it's just always interesting to see the path that people take. Yeah, well I appreciate you calling me professional. I'll try to live up to that. <laughs> Well, I think as Tamara already hinted at, you are going to be talking about a destination that I know is, you know, maybe not on a lot of people's radars, but if it is, it's definitely kind of one of those bucket list vacations. And you are going to be talking with us all about Antarctica and why, you know, you think that's a great destination for a family trip. So why don't you, you know, give us a little background. What made you choose Antarctica for your family vacation? You know, maybe it's just me, but the more difficult a destination is to visit, the more I am drawn to it. And fortunately, my older son shares this desire. So my husband and I decided to give him this bucket list trip to Antarctica as a high school graduation gift. It also allowed us to achieve our own, you know, personal goal of visiting all seven continents. But my husband and my younger son actually decided not to go on the trip. They decided it wasn't for them. They stayed home. Uh, And it's a decision that I think they ended up regretting. (laughs) They went skiing on Mount Hood instead. I don't really think it's comparable. (laughs) No penguins there. (laughs) No, no penguins in Oregon. Well, I know that there's a lot of choices when it comes into planning a trip to Antarctica. And I remember chatting with you and there's something kind of unique about the way you chose to do it. So can you tell us like how you went about researching it and how did you choose who you ended up going with? Yeah, you know, there are quite a few companies that will cruise from the tip of South America across the Drake Passage to Antarctica, but I'm really prone to seasickness. Um, I know this from lots of personal experience. So that itinerary just wasn't for me. You know, I would have been on my bathroom floor for two days down and two days back, and that does not sound like a good time. So there are two companies, Antarctica 21 and Quark, that will fly the Drake. So we went with Antarctica 21, and as far as the itinerary goes, you fly from the U.S. to Santiago, Chile, and then on to Punta Arenas near the tip of South America. And then, if all goes well, you fly on a chartered flight from there to Antarctica where you board the ship. From that point, it's very much like an Alaskan cruise where the ship is hugging the shoreline, so seasickness really wasn't an issue. And I say if all goes well because the entire trip is is super weather dependent. You basically have to wait in Punta Arenas for a good window of weather. And if you don't get out within four days, the entire trip is canceled and your money is refunded. We were really fortunate and got out on day one, our our scheduled day of departure. Okay, I'm not sure which makes me more nervous. The thought of going through the Drake Passage and how awful I would feel or... (laughs) You know, the if all goes well, I'm just picturing like a really small little prop plane and having it be very turbulent and bouncy. So what was that experience like? You know, I had in my mind this this picture that we were going to be like on a cargo plane and, you know, landing <laughs> on this airstrip. I had no idea. I was so surprised. 
the chartered flight is actually with a commercial airline called DAP, D-A-P, and they're a real commercial airline. And it was probably one of the better flights we've ever had. You walk onto this plane, which, by the way, is painted like a penguin. And so it's like oh, super man. cool. But you walk onto the plane, they hand you chocolates, you sit down, and it's just a two-hour flight from there to Antarctica, but they serve you a full meal. I mean, it was better service than I get on United. Yeah, wow. that's not hard to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Any domestic point. airline these days, it seems. <laughs> well, that's okay. So that's, I mean, that's doable. I'm the same way, severe motion sickness. So I would, I never even thought about doing it. So that's interesting to hear that you kind of had another option and the penguin plane would certainly be great for kids. So do you know, you know, thinking about bringing along kids, do you have any thoughts on how people could make sure like, is this right for my kids? Or how would I know? Um, maybe if my child's the right age, something like that? Yeah, you know, it's a really good point. And uh, we wrote an article on Kid Tripster about seven questions basically to ask uh, to see whether your child is ready for a trip like this. And you know, I'll just go through them quickly, uh, but I think they're all really important. The first is, will my child remember the trip? Now, I don't always say that a kid has to remember their travels in order to do it. You know, I think there's a lot of value traveling when you're, you're a young child, even if you're not going to remember the details. However, Antarctica is kind of a different beast. If you're going to invest the time and money into a trip like this, I'd want to make sure that your kid's going to remember it. So that's first and foremost. Can your child handle lots of air travel? As we already mentioned, I mean, it was like three days worth of air travel on the way down and two days on the way back. So you have to make sure your kid can actually do that. Does your child mind structured activities? We're going to talk about more, you know, in a few minutes what you do on the ship, but it is structured to a certain degree. And so your child has to be okay with that. There's also downtime on the ship. So you want to make sure that your child is mature enough to entertain themselves. There's no ch you know, kids clubs on ships like this, and there may be very few peers. So you want to make sure that they're able to occupy themselves. Do they follow directions to the letter? You know, anytime you're on a ship, there's safety concerns, but also concerns with wildlife. So you want to make sure that they're going to be able to follow the directions that guides give them. How do they do in cold weather? It will be cold. So you want to make sure that your kids can brave the elements. And then the final thing, which I think is the most important, does my child love nature? Because this type of trip is all about the nature. And if that's not your kid's jam, then they're probably not going to enjoy a trip like this. If it is, they're going to be in heaven. I should mention that most of the cruise lines do have a minimum age, and the minimum age on Antarctica 21 is eight years old. But my own personal recommendation is 13. Yeah, that makes sense. I think my kid would check off all of those except maybe the air travel. <laughs> that one we have to work on. Yeah, um, it's, it's a lot of flights. I mean, my 18 year old son is a very good traveler. But, you know, by the end of it, he was like, wow, that was that was a lot of travel, mom. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. But seeing those penguins probably made it worth it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I saw yeah. your pictures. I saw your videos. Actually, I was showing them to my daughter and it was always the, oh, you know. <laughs> he has no regrets. That's good. So I always see people um, going usually around like the Christmas holiday break, you know, because obviously you have a little bit more time off of school then. And I'm assuming it's because that's their summer and the, the window to go. But what is the best time of year to travel to Antarctica? So Antarctica has a very short tourist season, as you might expect. Um, it's basically early December to early March. If you're interested in seeing penguin chicks, um, you won't want to go earlier than late December. Typically, they hatch around Christmas. And then in late January, early February, they're going to be at their, you know, plump, fluffy, height of cuteness stage. However, the cruises at the beginning of December are usually a little bit cheaper. So that's certainly something to take into consideration. Because of my son's college schedule, we didn't have any flexibility and had to go over the Christmas holiday, which is unfortunately one of the more expensive times to sail. And while you won't have a ton of kids on these cruises, you will have more families during the holidays because, of course, you know, we're all working around those, those school schedules. So, you know, taking into account all the travel time that you're talking about and as we consider, you know, 
breaks and when to take kids out of school. How many days in total do you think people need to budget for, you know, traveling to and from and then also the cruise itself? So we elected to take a seven day, six night cruise. There are longer voyages, but again, they're going to be more expensive. And then we had three days travel on the way down and two full days on the way back. So our trip was a total of 12 days. Since you are going all the way to the tip of South America, though, some of the passengers on our ship did book extra days at the beginning of their trips to explore Patagonia in Chile. So that too is an option. Yeah, it's always one of those things. If you're going to fly all the way there, you know, yeah. why not see something else if you can? But that's still 12 days. You know, a lot of schools only have off for a week or maybe 10 days around the holiday time. So right. hard to manage without maybe pulling out for a couple of days. We are lucky because we have two weeks. But I mean, that would be a perfect amount of time to go there and back. Yeah, if only we have the... Uh, the budget one year. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit more about the cruise portion? I'm thinking it must be a little bit more like a Galapagos kind of cruise where, you know, there's certain, you, you get up at 8 a.m. and you go do this. So, you know, like there's certain things that you need to do, uh, maybe not as much flexibility as people might expect on your typical like Caribbean cruise or something, but how does it work? Yeah. So like other small ships um, or expedition cruises, you typically have two excursions a day. So there's going to be one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And, you know, sometimes you're loading into an inflatable raft called a Zodiac and going out on a nature viewing cruise. Sometimes you're actually doing a landing, often at a penguin colony. You know, we saw so many penguins on this trip, four species in all. But I, I have to say the most extraordinary day was when we landed at Bailey Head. It's the largest chin strap colony in Antarctica. I want, mm. I want you to guess how many penguins live in this one colony. I'm going to say 100,000. <laughs> oh, I was way off. Yeah. I was going to say like 10,000. <laughs> so 106,000 Wow. Penguins. Wow. And the chicks had just hatched 10 days earlier. Aww. I mean, it, it was beyond words. I mean, how I'm not, noisy was that? It was so noisy. <laughs> Penguins are so noisy. They're constantly cackling. And I'm, you know, I'm not easily wowed, but this site with the penguins, you know, as far as your eye could see, they were stretched up onto a cliff on one side and stretched all the way up on the mountains on the other side. It, it was honestly one of the most amazing things I have ever seen. And even my, you know, hard to impress teenager was in awe. So that was pretty spectacular. Um, you can also pay extra to do sea kayaking and snowshoeing while you're on the cruise. Um, snowshoeing was our favorite. Uh, on Contripster, I go into a rather lengthy explanation of why I don't think sea kayaking is worth the money. We did enjoy it, but it's an extra $895 a person, which wow. I think is pretty darn steep. So, Especially when we're opinion, on the West Coast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you could, you could ski or you could, um, sea kayak, you know, in Puget Sound. So, um, I think you could save yourself some money there. Sometimes in the afternoon and in the evening, someone on the expedition team would um, give a presentation on some aspect of Antarctica on the ship. Many of the guides actually had spent several seasons in Antarctica. One in particular, he'd been a um, glaciologist and had started coming to the continent way back in 1965. He even had a mountain range on the continent named for him. So it was really interesting learning from these people. And I'm, you know, I can easily geek out over these kinds of things. So I really enjoy those presentations. And I should also mention that they have a polar plunge off the ship into the frigid waters of the Southern Ocean. And every participant who's of age uh, follows it up with a shot of vodka. My son did the plunge, but, you know, there is no amount of alcohol before or after that would have gotten me into the water. So that is not something I did. <laughs> I wonder how that's safety wise. Like, I would be scared. <laughs> what if they get cold? They can't get, you know, like, I assume there's somebody there to grab them afterwards. Or yeah, I don't know. They actually, they actually tie a rope to you. Okay. So you jump in and then they very quickly pull you out. They don't, they don't let you stay in the water. Oh my goodness. That's scary. But I have a few daredevils that would go for that. 
Yeah, no, my son, you know, there was no question he was going to do it. And I was safely videotaping it from a couple of decks up. So, uh, yeah, that's not for me. <laughs> so how many passengers were on the ship with you? And, you know, you said you were traveling during the you know, Christmas holiday season. So were there other families or what was the, you know, what was the makeup of the other passengers like? Yeah. So the ship itself is about 239 feet long. So there's 46 crew members and 72 passengers, though I believe on our cruise there were only 68. Um, But either way, you know, the staff to passenger ratio is pretty extraordinary. And just to quickly describe like what the cabin looks like, the, the rooms have two twin beds and then the ability to pull down bunk beds. Um, you have an ensuite bathroom just like you would on any other cruise ship. And on this particular ship, there was like a small gym with floor to ceiling windows that made you almost want to work out because the view was so great. Um, there's a library, again, with those great big windows and then a single lounge with a bar. And that's typically where you found most of the passengers hanging out. It was a really interesting group of people. As you might expect, um, these are pretty intrepid travelers. They were from all around the world, 11 countries represented, it, represented certainly the most diverse group of passengers I've ever been with. And most of them, I would say at least half of them, were visiting their seventh continent just like we were. So that's pretty extraordinary. And in fact, there was this one family that this was their seventh continent this year, which wow. I was like, wow, that, that's super crazy. And as far as kids, out of the 68 passengers, there were 11 kids on board under the age of 18. That's probably a little more than the average during a holiday cruise. And that's mostly because there were four families from Beijing, China that were traveling together. They were all neighbors and they had nine kids um, between them. So they sort of uh, pushed up that that average as far as the number of kids on board. Hmm. So for the activities and the excursions, you mentioned that some were extra, but things like the sightseeing cruises and like landing to see the penguins, was that included? Yes. So all of your um, Zodiac cruises and the landings, um, everything on board, that's all included. The only thing you're paying extra for is the sea kayaking at eight ninety five dollars a person and the um, snowshoing, which was $195 a person. Again, kind of steep, but... My son really enjoyed that part of it because, you know, he's an active kid and he, he wants to be more active. And, you know, we with the amount of food we were eating on board, you know, just like any cruise, um, I wanted to be active, too. So we really enjoyed that snowshoeing. And, you know, what's interesting about this is if you sign up for either the sea kayaking or the snowshoeing, it's not a set number of times. Everything on this cruise is very fluid. So where you're going on a day-to-day basis, the expedition team doesn't even know until that day. I mean, it's that weather dependent. It's, you know, they're really looking at the sea conditions. And so you have to be super flexible. So on our cruise, there was only two opportunities to snowshoe, but on the previous cruise, there were seven opportunities to snowshoe. So the price is the same either way. It's just, you know, uh, up to them as to what they think um, is doable on that particular day. Interesting. And and when they are, the activities are taking place, the, the ones that are included, is everyone going at the same time or do they break up the groups? Like somebody goes in the morning and the afternoon and then they switch or something like that? So they have enough Zodiacs that they can take everyone out who's not either sea kayaking or snowshoeing. They can take everyone out at the same time. And so you're not, you're, there's not a morning where you won't be doing something or not an afternoon where you're not doing something unless you choose to, but you know, why would you choose to stay on the ship, right? (laughs) You're getting off the ship. You want to go see what there is to see. And did you, so here's an odd question, just really quickly talking about different activities and excursions. Um, So did you have any opportunities to do any of the research or that would allow, because I have animal crazy kids. So are there any opportunities for like animal encounters or anything at research stations or anything like that? 
So at the landing, sometimes there's a small research station, but we weren't, there was never a situation where that research station was actually open. And these are like tiny places. It's not like a, a research base. Um, other times when you do a landing, you're, you're just out in the wild. There's, there's nothing there. And so as far as the interactions go, you're having the interactions because you are right there in the middle of it. So the guides will set up like sort of a, um, a, a course that you can hike and then they station themselves um, along that course to ask, you know, answer any questions that you, you might have. Technically, you're supposed to stay within a few feet of the animals, but if you stand there and a penguin comes waddling over to you or waddling by you, that's perfectly okay. I mean, I was within a foot of penguins because they waddled to me. And these penguins really are sort of, uh, you know, they, they don't care that you're there. You're, you, they don't really react to you. They are on a mission. They are going from their nest um, to the sea along these penguin highways. So they are... I mean, it's one of the most amazing things to watch. In Antarctica in particular, they nest in places that you would never expect. They have to nest on rocky areas. They cannot lay eggs on snow or ice. So they are often very high up on mountainsides, on these rocky ledges, and then they'll waddle down the penguin highways to the sea. And then once they once they hit the water, they are like bullets. And they, you know, shoot off. They feed, you know, sometimes they'll swim for several miles, they'll come back, and then they have to waddle up these mountainsides. Um, I mean, really, they make it super hard on themselves because of where they nest. But you're in the middle of all of that. So you're, you're seeing it. I have to say, we had a really interesting uh, opportunity. There were two researchers who were there for an extended period of time, uh, four months, at one of the locations where we stopped. And so they were actually living in a tent in Antarctica <sighs> from November to February. Oh my and our, yeah, the staff on our ship invited them on. They had breakfast with us one morning and got a hot shower. I mean, the first hot breakfast and hot shower they had had in a month. Oh. Um, and they were working for the Norwegian government and they're studying how penguins eat, how much they need in order to survive so that the Norwegian government can set fishing requirements on krill. And so these people were so interesting. They, they have been mounting little mini cameras on the penguins at that chin strap colony that I described and in a GPS device. And then they have been tracking the penguin movements and they shared some of the video with me. It's penguin cam video. I mean, it's mm -hmm. incredible. And uh, we've posted it on Kitripster uh, and on our social account, so you can take a look at it. it. It was pretty cool. This should be the new version of like the puppy bowl, yeah, <laughs> like, the, the penguin bowl, or the giraffe. Like, you know, waiting me. for the giraffe. <laughs> so, do we have oh, the, the one that was giving birth? That was giving yeah. birth, yeah. <laughs> giraffe. Yeah. <laughs> we just bought a new treadmill, and it, it's Nordic Track, and it has you know the different programs that you can do, where it looks like you're in different places around the world, and there's one, there's a few in Antarctica, but I know that I've done one where you're like really walking uh, among the penguins. So now I want to go upstairs and do. And do that when we're done talking. I get um, to see how realistic it is. Yeah, uh, I guess, but it's not as cold. Uh, so, can you tell us a little bit about about the weather, or like how cold is it really? I mean, we're sitting here in winter, talking about it being negative degrees out. So, is it worse than that? What is it like? You know, you'd be surprised. Um, you're traveling in Antarctica's summer. And we were really blessed with good weather. The average temperature on the peninsula where the ships typically cruise is about 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And, mm. you know, with the wind, it felt more like maybe the mid-20s. But still, uh, it was warmer in Antarctica than I bet it is in Rhode Island today. <laughs> um, and when you're actively hiking in deep snow, snowshoeing, kayaking, you know, you're generating some of your, your own heat. In fact, when we were snowshoeing, my son and I got so warm, we actually took off our jackets and he was snowshoeing in a short sleeve shirt and I was snowshoeing in a long sleeve lightweight shirt in Antarctica. It was wild. That's great. 
I mean, it reminds me of when we were in Iceland in the summer and we were uh, dog sledding on the glacier one day and our um, musher was in shorts. But, you know, I still expect Antarctica to be even colder than Iceland. So, Right. And you have to go prepared because we were fortunate, but certainly the weather there is ever changing. It could have been a lot colder and you would have needed to, to be ready for that. Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense, you know, kind of one of those layering, another opportunity to, as we always say, layer when you pack for cold weather. Absolutely. So talking about layering and packing, do you have any packing tips to share that you kind of experienced or that you, um, that worked well or what you wish you would have done differently? Yeah, you know, I have a hard and fast rule about packing, no matter where I go or for how long, I only pack one carry on and one backpack. And the same is true for everyone in my family. I did manage to do it for this trip, but admittedly, it was challenging because of all that, you know, big, bulky winter gear. The key is not to overpack. You know, the atmosphere on the ship is very casual. There are no formal events. Um, so jeans and sweater, you know, perfectly fine for dinner. And let's be honest. You, I mean, you're not really sweating up your clothes in Antarctica. So you can get away with just a few shirts, you know, sweater, uh, sweatshirts, two pairs of pants. I mean, you're good. Um, footwear wise, they do provide boots. So you, you just need to bring one pair of shoes for travel and the time you have on the ship. The one thing that we did bring that we shouldn't have was a lot of those like little hottie hand and mm -hmm. feet warmers. We brought enough for each one of us for every single day of the cruise, but we never used a single one. <laughs> and so that was a bunch of wasted space. Um, plus, they trip off the airport security. And so we constantly got stopped um, during, you know, going through the checkpoints. So, you know what, leave those at home. Hmm. That's good to know. I just brought a bunch of those when I went skiing, but they were in my checked bag. So I don't think it bothered anything. Yeah, no, I was kind of surprised, but they did set off the um, security uh, alerts there. Makes sense. I've had, we, we use reusable ones because we take them when the girls go skiing and then they're the ones that are activated and then you boil them and they re reset. So oh, I didn't even know there were reusable ones. Yeah. They're really nice, but they're liquidy. So I would never really pack them because I wouldn't know the actual amount of liquid in them. So, yeah. So what about the food? Uh, was it your typical cruise food? What did you have assigned seating, you know, at different tables or what was the dining situation like on the cruise? So I've now sailed on three main cruise lines and four small ship cruises. And I have to say Antarctica 21 had the best food out of any of them. It was really spectacular, especially when you consider, you know, the logistics involved. The ships are only in port every two months, um, but they do get a supply of fresh food fruit and vegetables when you fly in. Um, and I think the ship had the right balance between speed and service. So breakfast and lunch are ser served buffet style. So you don't have to wait through a lengthy table service. Um, and at dinner, you get your salad and your soup on the buffet. Appetizers are preset at the table. And then you select uh, your entree from a choice of three and your dessert. And desserts, ugh, to die for. Like I still dream about the desserts <laughs> on this cruise. And if you have any dietary concerns, it's not a problem. The chef will, you know, totally accommodate you. As far as seating, it's all open seating. So, you know, in the course of a week, I think we sat with every single person on the ship and, you know, got to know them. And like I said, really interesting people from around the world. Nice. That's great to hear. Yeah, I love also hearing it's nice that there's a private chef in a little smaller group because I, um, as our listeners know, I travel with a child with allergies and she'd probably be the one that would be perfect for this kind of trip. And so it's nice to know that that would probably actually work well for our situation. Yeah, there were plenty of passengers um, who were either gluten free or vegetarian, vegan or had, you know, specific allergies and they were very accommodating uh, you know, it's it's a chef, a sous chef, and a, and a small staff. I mean, you can walk into the kitchen and talk to them about it, um, but they are very, very good at what they do. So with all this amazing good food and service and experiences, we have come to the time to get some sticker shock maybe, but why don't you tell our listeners how much you think they should be budgeting for this amazing, you know, bucket list kind of vacation to Antarctica? 
Yeah, that's really the rub, isn't it? <laughs> um, as you may expect, a trip to Antarctica isn't cheap at all. Um, in fact, it's probably the most expensive vacation that you'll ever take, making it truly a once-in-a-lifetime experience. The cruise is priced per person, and the first four cruises in December are the least expensive. Now, for those, for a twin cabin on the Ocean Nova, which is the ship that we sailed on, it's $12,995 per person. I'll let that sink in for a moment. Uh, <laughs> For a triple cabin, it drops to $11,395 per person. Wow. Uh, so that includes your flight to and from Antarctica, but does not inf- include the flights to get to Punta Arenas. Um, it includes two nights of hotel in Punta Arenas, uh, the night before you leave and then the night you get back. All of your food, um, all of your excursions, minus the sea kayaking and snowshoeing, as I mentioned, those are extra. Comparatively, if you were to take a more traditional cruise to Antarctica and actually sail the Drake instead of fly it, it would probably run you about 25% cheaper. Um, So you're definitely paying for the convenience of flying to the continent. So yes, once in a lifetime. (laughs) You know, I've been debating, like, which do I want to see more, polar bears or penguins? And I've been thinking recently, well, it's a lot easier. It's still expensive, but it's a lot easier to get to Churchill (laughs) than it is to get to Antarctica. But even that was, I think, I don't know, maybe 7,500 or 6,000 a person, like definitely much, much cheaper. But I would love to do them both someday. But then you can't say you've been to seven continents. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I still, I still have a couple to get to. I'm, I'm only hitting Africa for the first time uh, in March. So, well, you, you have plenty of time to, to get to them all. Yeah, I need to work on it. So it seems like there were a lot of um, contingencies, you know, with the weather and and all of that. So, like, what happens? If you fly down there, especially if that flight isn't included and then you can't go, like, so did you buy travel insurance for that or how do you handle that kind of situation? Yeah, this is actually one of the few trips that I did purchase uh, travel insurance for. And actually, it's required. You have to purchase travel insurance in order to travel with Antarctica 21. And you'll want it in case the trip does get canceled and or you need to be evacuated for medical reasons. I did quite a bit of research on travel insurance. And we have a companion story on Kid Tripster that you can read. But we ended up going with World Nomad. Um, I think they actually have the best value for the money when it comes to travel insurance. Yeah, it's good. I just did some research and compared some things for our upcoming trip as well. I mean, we have an annual plan that I do, but uh, I wanted to make sure that our coverage was a little bit higher um, for a little bit more of an expensive trip. So it's important to really read the fine print and compare it, even though I hate reading fine print. (laughs) Absolutely. And in travel insurance, especially because from company to company to po- from policy to policy, it can be very different. How did I'm just thinking through also because you said with the flight, so you get down to Point Arenas and you are there waiting. You said, you know, you got lucky and it went out on the first day when it was scheduled to go out. But does the cruise then continue the same amount of length or do you have to also then be flexible say your flight you don't get out until the second day is the cruise still the six nights and so then you need to adjust that outbound flight as well my understanding was that you would basically lose a day on the cruise side okay so and then what they do is is that day that you're you know stuck in punto arenas they have activities that uh they incorporate so that you still have some sort of excursion there's another um penguin colony that's not too terribly far from punto arenas that's you know in south america so my understanding is that they set up trips and things like that um to keep you busy oh okay so when you booked your hotel, did you book it to end that day um, or did you like have extra days just in case? Like, how do you handle that part? You know, we booked as if everything was going to go smooth sailing and fortunately yeah. it did. So they will cover when you come back from Antarctica, you stay at the same hotel that you did prior and that night is covered. And then the next day 
uh, you, you make, you, you fly from there to Santiago and then, and then start your trip back. So on the way down, we had an extra night of hotel in Santiago because just of the way the, the flights worked out and getting in too late to move on. Um, but on the way back, we were able to do a, you know, uh, a, a flying, we flew for basically two days solid yeah. and, and <laughs> overnight. Interesting. That's nice on that West Coast, you know, you can chase the day, but coming, but going there, we always, we always lose yeah. a day. <laughs> exactly. That's what happened. Great. So do you, you know, going back a little bit, this is one of the questions that we ask all of our guests. I know we've already talked about kind of what to pack, but we always ask our guests, what do you wear when you're traveling? And so do you want to share what you wore when you went to Antarctica? Anything specific or a particular brand that you really loved? Absolutely. So we're actually big fans of Columbia Sportswear. (laughs) So conveniently, the company is headquartered literally down the street from our house. So we have access to the employee store uh, and can purchase at a discount, which is one of my favorite things. But for this trip, both my son and I wore their titanium out dry jackets with Omni Heat 3D. Those jackets are like little furnaces. And like I said, you know, at one point we took them off because we were actually too warm when we were snowshoeing. Um, But I also like them because they're really lightweight. They don't weigh you down like some um, winter jackets do. So uh, I'm a a big fan of uh, Columbia brand and we were pretty much in Columbia head to toe. Yeah, that's good. My I have Columbia like the thin Omni Heat jackets too, and then we have Columbia rain pants and all kinds of Columbia gear in this house. I feel we like it's the employee to... discount, but we do have an outlet nearby. <laughs> oh, oh nice. nice! I was gonna say I feel like I need to have a little trip down to Portland now. Go for that. Oh, I, so. I mean, we have uh, you know both Nike and Columbia down here in Portland, and so. it's tax free. So there we go. That's right. That's <laughs> three hour great. three hour drive sounds pretty good to me. I could make it worth your while. <laughs> <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> So that trip, I'm sure, uh, set you back both time-wise and budget-wise for a while. But do you have any more trips coming up uh, personally or maybe some of your other writers on Kib Tripster that people should look out for? And can you just remind our listeners where they can find you online? Absolutely. So uh, as you know, I'm always planning travel. Uh, It definitely (laughs) is kind of my thing. So we'll be in Florida for spring break. And then we're headed to Ireland, Northern Ireland and Iceland in late May, early June. Um, You know, I know we've been talking about uh, your Iceland trip and then getting some pointers. So I seem to have a thing for polar regions. Um, (laughs) So I'm looking forward to Iceland as well and Ireland. Uh, And yes, of course, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and our newly revamped Pinterest pages. We've taken a lot of time to make those more user-friendly. And you'll find us at Kid Tripster uh, across all those platforms. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experience today. It's it's nice to kind of get a a more of an inside view of what it's like, you know, day to day, because I think when we see pictures, we see the, the wonderful penguin pictures, but we don't know, you know, what is it really like? And is it worth it to, to go through some of what you need to go through to get down there to, to, to see those cute penguins. So thank you. Yes. And, and to speaking to that point, we do have content on uh, Kid Tripster where we do a day by day journal. So we go into, you know, a lot of details so that you know exactly what you're getting for the money. Good. Yeah, well, we'll definitely really link to that in our show notes. Perfect. Sounds like a great trip and once in a lifetime, but probably something that you know, the right family, it definitely would appeal and be worth maybe budgeting and saving up for. I'm thinking maybe like a grad gift, right? You know, save up for the four years, although then you're going into college. So maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what it was for us. And believe me, there were there there were years of saving. In, yeah, in order it happened. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Shelly. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode here at Vacation Mavens. And I just want to let you guys know, if you have a teen that you're traveling with, like Tamara and I, we have started a new Facebook group. It is called Travel with Teens, and you can find it at facebook.com slash groups slash travel with teens. And we also will link to it in the show notes, but we would love to have you hop over there. And maybe even if you have a tween, we're going to be sharing just lots of great 
conversations about, you know, what it's like to travel with this, you know, new age group and the challenges and also the joys and delights that come with it. And we've already had a great chat about our favorite our teen's favorite destination so far. So maybe if you're still thinking about where you want to go for your next family vacation, you should join that group and then get the ideas and see what other teens have loved. Yeah, we hope to see you over there. And in the meantime, uh, stay tuned because in the coming weeks, we have some really good episodes. We're going to be covering some of the uh, civil rights uh, sites. If you wanted to take a civil rights tour, and we're also talking about Puerto Rico and the Florida Keys. So if you were looking for more beach or warm weather destinations, uh, we have some ideas for you. So stay tuned. Thanks again. We'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm.